Hi, this is Jay Harwich and another edition of Amazing Conversations with my old friend, Roger McDowell. Roger is going to be coming up for Amazing Day this Saturday. This is the first time we've ever done this, Roger. So we have six of the alumni guys, be you, Mookie, Tough, uh, Glendid, um, Turk, and Hojo. I can't forget Hojo. Yeah, Hojo. And what we're going to do, Roger, we're going to be getting all over the city. Uh, there's a lot of excitement out with the Mets. We're sure they're going to be Plushy Metal Park, Woman Rink, uh, Fifth Avenue MLB Store, uh, Astoria Park, Union Square. You're going to be at the MLB store on 51st Street with Hojo. Okay. My question to you is, when, when somebody sees you, Roger McDowell, they ask about the 1986 World Series, right. your appearance on Seinfeld, yep. or or your, your hot foot with, with Hojo, we, what do you think they're going to ask you most about? The, the construction. If, it, if I'm with Hojo, it'll be the it'll be the hot foot. It'll definitely be the hot foot. Um, and, you know, the, the other thing, too, um, that I think – forgot to mention is because back in the day especially in the mid 80s when we were pretty good you know, mtv was huge mtv right. was big and uh they had the mtv rock and jock games on and so i get i get that more than i get playing baseball uh yeah i get the i get the sign i get seinfeld hot foot and mtv rock and jock and then oh by the way you you play the game and you coach for a period of years. Let me ask you a personal question. Do you still get any residuals from the Seinfeld show? Yeah, they're not as uh, often as they used to be, Jay. Uh, I do get them maybe, I don't know, once every other month now. So you were the, you were the third spitter? I forget. My memory's second, getting big in my old age. Second spitter. There was, it, was a, spitter. it was a spoof on the JFK. Um, he was my idol. You know, that John Kennedy's my idol. I wanted to work for John Kennedy growing up. Really? I got diverted, yeah. I, didn't I wanted, to be, I wanted well, to be. Well, thankfully for us, and yeah, and I wanted Mets. to be pure salad. You know, and I got diverted. No, you know, you, you found but, your way to the Mets. So Keith, Keith yeah, Keith, April first was my forty third year with the Mets. Forty third year, April first. Yeah, this year. So it's not a, it's not an April Fool's joke. No, I did a couple of April Fool's joke, but no, it's it's a, So I started with the Mets when I was twelve. <laughs> so, so it was 43 plus 12. I'm yeah. 55 now. It took me a minute to do the math there, but yeah, yeah. you're right. <laughs> but, you know, but, you know it, it's funny you, you bring up April 1st. That was uh, that was the day that Davy Johnson told me I made the club in 1985, April 1st. And I thought it was April Fool's joke. You know what else happened in April 1st, 1985? Sid Finch. Was was that? Was that? that Sid Finch in Sports Illustrated. We signed this six foot right. guy. From Uganda, wherever the hell he was, and threw a 190 mile an hour uh, fastball. Remember Ron Reynolds, catcher? Oh, sure. So we had in the old Hug and Stango Field House, we had to put a tent up. You put a tent around burnt, the old batting cage. Yeah, and we burnt a hole in Ron's glove, and he came out and made rest in peace. Mel Stong and my Ron did a press conference, and it was this was Sid's curveball, and we had burnt the hole right in the middle of his catching glove. You know, I remember as players, we didn't know what was going on, and, and you were mum. Uh, it was it was well concealed. Nobody was allowed in there. Nobody could look in there. I mean, there were very few people that knew about Sid Finch, uh, and all we heard was that there was somebody in the batting cage, and they were at some type of tryout, and that's all we knew. Um, maybe the older players, you know, some of the experienced guys and the veteran guys, maybe you know they got um, some knowledge of it. But that was my first year. My well, '85 was my first year in the big leagues. So, I mean, I was if if if, if it wasn't told to me, I wasn't going to go looking for anything. We we can never do this. Maybe digress one second. What do you think? There was no Twitter back there. What do you think the R86 guys would if they were on Twitter back then? What would have happened? I think we'd have been fine. You see, you do? Yeah, I do. I do. I mean, I think it would have been fine, really. I mean, could it have gotten any worse? No, it couldn't have gotten any worse. That's a, that's a good point. No? I never knew what to expect when I got to the ballpark, Roger. My favorite thing, there's a cartoon in the Daily News back there. There was two kids and their father say, Daddy, Daddy, I want to see the Mets. And they were standing in front of a courthouse. 
in Manhattan. And the guy said, well, said, well here they are. <laughs> so you're going to be teamed up with when Howard hit the team store. But that night, you're going to the Gotham Comedy Club. Okay. And people can get tickets here where you, with Turk. You know, okay. we say it in a nice way. Your personality is a little bit, eh, a little to the left, maybe. I mean, a little upbeat. Uh, more than that, Roger. And Turk, what, what's with relief pictures that they're a little bit nuts in a nice way? I mean, um, you know what Turk's foibles. Yeah, yeah, you know? that, that is a nice way of putting it, but I, I think it comes with the territory of the job of waiting around for, and if you're a late inning guy, it's waiting around for six or seven innings to pitch, uh, occupying that time, um, and also the the ups and downs of being a relief pitcher, of, of being successful or unsuccessful, of having um, a short memory and also being able to not so much laugh about um, something that, that uh, didn't go my way or Turk's way, but being able to uh, move ahead and move on. See, Turk was super stitch. He had stuff. He had to brush his teeth before and now. And he chewed yeah, liquid. I didn't, I didn't have that. I didn't, have, didn't, any, I didn't have any super stitch. I mean, like the black licorice? Yeah, the black, you didn't do the black licorice thing. No, I didn't. I, I mean, I had bubble gum. Um, and that was that was my only vice at the time. But now you did, if my memory say, was it in L.A. where you came on the field standing with your uh, upside down? Yeah, but that was just that was just being a goofball, you know. I, I think I think I think, one, I think one of those superstitions, and and uh, you know, if you talk to Jesse, you can probably correct me, or he can probably correct the, the conversation. But I remember uh, one of the things that Jesse and I used to do is um, we'd have to have a cheeseburger and play uh, cards before the game every game. It was just him and I. Who who what? It was probably fifty fifty. You know, but the thing about Jesse. I mean, it, you know, veteran player, minor league, uh, major league pitcher coach, X amount of years. How, how much has the bullpen changed? You know, with Davey, you do these guys, it was one you, one one day you, one you next. And I mean, and, and you, I remember the one game in the, the sixth game in Houston with Bobby O, Aggie, you, and Jesse. Jesse covered 16 innings, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. That can never, ever happen again today. I don't think so. I don't think so. And, uh, I think it's a sign of the times too, Jay. It's it, it's a different game, um, and even in our era, it's it was different back in the '60s when you had 30 plus complete games. And so, I mean, it, it's just evolved to where, you know, uh, my first year in '85, like we were talking about, there were 10 man pitching staff and four probably four and a half starters. Because you really didn't need a fifth starter a lot of the times because of the off days that were in the schedule and the double headers. And you remember us playing double headers and you needed a fifth guy for that. But we had 10 guys in the bullpen. Nowadays, you you know, it's minimum of 13. And a lot of times, uh, depending on uh, where you play, who you play, um, what you use, sometimes there might be 15 guys in a bullpen nowadays. And so it's just it's a it's, it's a different era. It's a different time, and um, um, whether it's better or, or not better, um, just we were we were we were supposed to pitch multiple innings, and everybody did. Do you do you think the injury you suffered in '84 really it, it only turned into a blessing because you read that helped you develop your sinker? I mean. Yeah. You, yeah, I think I think so. I mean, I sat out all of '84. I had uh, bone chips removed from my elbow, and I had a sinker. I was a sinker, curveball, changeup type pitcher in the minor leagues, and even growing up, but going in the minor leagues, uh, in the Metro uh, minor leagues, and then I had the surgeon in '84, and they moved removed 13 bone chips from my elbow, and kind of freed it up, and so I got a little bit more. Um, I guess extension ability to get extension, and uh, I did. I had a bit. I had a better sinker. Uh, I also had a better velocity as well because my elbow didn't hurt all the time. Your first year was '85, right? In '84, we won 90 games. Won 98 games in '86. Uh, in '85, 108, 116 in '86. Do you think the Mets today are kind of 
in a similar place waiting to have that breakthrough year. And we were on the verge for a couple of years last year with 101 games. Don't right. make it. Do you, is there any parallels you think of where? I think, the, I think there's a, a lot of similarities. I think there's a, a similar path. Um, you know, if you think about, uh, you know, I can't, I can't speak so much on, you know, the Mets of today, but just following along and following that path, you know, and I understand this now, but I didn't understand it back in 85 when I was my first year. But the part that I understand is you got to learn to win. Um, you got to learn to know what the grind is of major league season. You got to have some veterans on the, on the ball club. And, uh, you know, you got to have a pitching staff. And you got to have a pitching staff that covers, from a starting standpoint, you want to co- you want them to cover probably at least 900 innings um, because there's usually about 1,400 innings in a season. So it used to be where, you know, starting staffs would cover 1,000 to 1,100 innings somewhere along in there, and your relievers picked up the rest. Well, uh, there's, there's a bigger priority on, on uh, relievers picking up innings and having depth in your organization to be able to do that. But the parallels, you know, you learn, we, we had to learn how to win. We had to have some veteran leadership. And also we had to have that leader, um, much like Davey Johnson, uh, that they have in Buck Showalter. And I think he's a terrific leader. And I think the fact that you know, when pieces start to come together, you have to have some luck, um, no doubt about it. But uh, you know, and the unfortunate injury that uh, they have with the closer now with Diaz, it's. Uh, I think that guys will step up. Uh, I think they will find a way. And you know, from like I said, from that parallel standpoint, there are a lot of similarities. Did you see the Diaz thing live? And with Diaz thing live, what was your reaction? Do you have a feeling one way or the other on the WBC or? or... Yeah, I really don't. I really don't. I mean, you know, uh, I wish it could be in a, a different. Um, time because uh, because these guys are getting ready for spring training but getting ready through spring training for a season well when you have the wbc early what happens is now your guys have to get ready earlier and so from the pitching standpoint it, sometimes it makes it difficult but uh, i don't think there's a perfect time um or situation that it could occur um so, I mean, it is it is what it is, and you move forward. But you, in your time with the Mets, can you, you know, you, you're, you're coming up for this event of eight today on Saturday, and it, it, a week later you're going to Florida for a convention of uh, Met fans in, in a hard rock hotel. The seven line. Seven line. Yeah. Yeah. Could you, could you feel that? I mean, you, you were here all the time with the game came once before. We came up in 83. If my memory, it was still – we were a bad team still. I yeah. mean, we didn't really turn until Davey came on board. Could, could you sense a new enthusiasm from Met fans? I mean, when you when you, when you come to the city, I know you have a daughter who lives here. Or a... Yeah. Um, well, you know what? I mean, I was thinking about this earlier, Jay, is that, uh, and you talked about the guys that are going to be there and Tough and Mookie and, and Turk. And, and Hojo. And Hojo. Don't forget Hojo. Please don't um, forget Hojo. But – but it's at the end of the day, the players come and go. Okay, uh, obviously we have um, our favorites. Um, I have my favorites uh, that I played with as a New York Met. And but the thing is, is the players come and go. The fans are a mainstay. And once they become Met fans, if or if there are any other organizations fans. But once they're Met fans, they're Met fan for life. And so over the course of years, you know, they start out five, six, seven years old. And, you know, they're going to go through a lot of players and they're still going to be Met fans. And so I think that's that's the beauty of it is that uh, when you go back to New York, it doesn't really matter what era you played on. You played for the Mets and the people that support the Mets are going to support that team no matter what. So we two world champions, 69 was the first to last the first. And, and our team in 86 was, do you think it would have made it iconic to different personalities on the team, on the team, you know, Doc and Straw, Lenny and Wally, you and Jesse, you know, Kid, Keith, Ray, Mitch. I mean, what do you think, I mean, the way we won coming back from the dead, I mean, what do you think still 
uh, this team is holds in such high esteem after so it's forty like almost forty years almost. Yeah, I, I think uh, there's a lot of relay relay relatability uh, to to that club. Um, you know, if if you remember, Jay, we had we had five platoons, and, and you, you want to talk about the camaraderie and the so-called culture. But we had five platoons. We had a platoon at second base. Uh, we've had a platoon at third base. We had a platoon in center field, a platoon in left field, and we had a platoon at the closer role. And so there, there was there weren't any egos. And I think that's what's relatable to Met fans and people who have really are diehard uh, baseball followers of the New York Mets is that, you know, it, it's more of a uh, bring your lunchbox to work kind of atmosphere that we had. Uh, we had we had really good players and we had superstar players, but at the end of the day, we had uh, blue collar guys that went out and grinded and worked. And, and the most important thing was winning that night's game. Do you do you enjoy the back and forth of the fans? I wish you would go to the team store and whether it's Seinfeld or or the or eighty six to buy play with you and Howard were good friends, a lot of history together. Do you enjoy the chance to have some back and forth with the fans? Always, Jay, always. Um, like I said a bit before about the Met fans, um, I played for five, six different clubs, and the Met fans are the best. And so having an opportunity to come back and get together with them and be part of uh, uh, leading up to uh, the culmination of this season. So. It's going to be uh, it's going to be a lot of fun, and it's going to be very enjoyable, and we'll have a lot of good times reminiscing and uh, also looking forward to this season. So when you get to go to the, the Gotham Comedy Club at night, were you and Turk <laughs> to have an act together, or were you think you? You know what I just remembered is that do you remember was it Game Six the parachuters came down? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Third inning, something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You were in, in there. You know, he was a comedian. Really? Yeah, he was a, he was a comedian that performed at the comedy club, and I don't know. After you know a week or ten days after that World Series, we went and saw him at the comedy club, and uh, yeah, he was a hoot. He was he was awesome. You know what? You you gave me an idea. Maybe I should get some material. I think it'd be great. You know, we we could drop down from the ceiling. You know, parachute down on stage and everything. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if we we'll go that far, Jay. I'm, I'm 62 years old. <laughs> right, I'm 70. Maybe, maybe, maybe just walk up. Yeah. Well, let me get back to you mentioned Davey. What made Davey such a good manager? You know, he didn't really need to manage. He was a wealthy guy, got his degree, a mathematics degree, uh, was a pilot, and sure, I mean, a real estate. Why Why was he the perfect guy for, for the 86 team? You know, again, Jay, I mean, back, you know, those were my formula – formulative years in in the big leagues and so i didn't really i didn't really know i just knew he was the manager and whatever he told me to do i did but you know looking back uh, as i've gotten older and been around the game and been on a coaching staff and been with different managers i think the biggest thing that that davy brought was that he uh, didn't have many rules uh very few rules but the rules that were enforced were enforced by, by the veteran players for the right. most part uh, you know, the Ray, Ray Knights and Mookie Wilson and Keith Hernandez and Gary Carters um, of the world at uh, Lee Mazzilli. Um, those guys that were, um, they were they were lieutenants uh, under the leadership of Davey. And I think that was the biggest part was that uh, we, we learned from those guys because Davey entrusted those players to lead us in the right direction. Do you still wear your ring at all? Yeah, I don't have it on now. I've been doing yard work, so I don't have it on now. But, yeah, I, I wear it. Uh... I can't tell my, my ring story. Uh, in uh, 2003, it was like it was uh, – I got out of high school in 1963, so 37, with my 40th year coming out of high school. Yeah. I was good. I had a crush on a majorette at Clifton High School. So I was going to be the big guy, and, hey, I got my World Series ring. So we go to we go to the hotel, and make a long story short, I got the day screwed up. My class was on a Saturday, 
I went on a Friday. The girl wasn't there. And I jammed the, 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 the finger on my thing so badly. They had a blowtorch the damn thing off. And I haven't really, I haven't worn it since. You know, I, I have it you at home. You, I was didn't, able, you didn't go man, back on Saturday. But I, I was embarrassed. I told people we're looking for you on Saturday. We made a trade and couldn't go back. I just got the day screwed up. So, so is there still a, a, a blowtorch? Uh... I never got it fixed. It's, it's at home. And I, I was trying to impress. Her first name was Sandy. Would be the love of my life. You know, I was going to show her. See what you miss, Sandy? What was that song, the country western song, Look at Me Now? Yeah. Who sang it? Yeah. That was going to be me. See, I have a world series ring. Nah, 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 nah. Didn't work out that way. So, <laughs> she, instead, you, instead, that you, smear, instead I, you had a date with the fireman or the ironworks guy. Yeah, it was a, a blowtorch my ring and uh, but, but whatever. But now, now, yeah. I'm sure there's a lot of people listening and or watching that are trying to figure out how they blowtorched your ring off. Well, they didn't see the blowtorch. They, 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 they burn your finger? They ripped it off, whatever it was. I could, my finger had swollen up so much, they couldn't get it off. They had to cut the ring. Well, however well, they those, did. It's from your boxing days, your knuckles. My boxing people. days, yeah, it, 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 it the ring. But that was my one story, try to press the lovely oh, Sandy. Sandy. Yeah. <laughs> now, I, now, now, that being said, did you ever find out if Sandy showed up on Saturday night? I didn't have the guts to ask, to be honest with you. I, didn't I mean, was she married? I think she's divorced now. To be honest, her husband died. Yeah. But maybe, I maybe she's watching this now. Watch her. Maybe, I'm a romantic. Maybe you need to get the ring fixed. I'm, no, I didn't get it fixed. Ring fixed. Yeah. I'm a romantic. It was a I'm, sure that well, I'm, I'm sure that blowtorch guy knows a welder. <laughs> so do you, know, do you know how to get yeah, It's getting back to an amazing day. All you guys are on the field in a Fletcher Maiden Park. Your coach is like a little league team, 10 to 12 years old. And all the 60 guys will be together. It'd be, a, it'd be a good day. I mean, you can sense it. I mean, we've never really, I've been here a long time. I've never been as much excitement before a season started, coming up to 101 wins. I think the thing we're doing with Amazing Day, and you're going to Florida to have a, a thing with the seven line, it that hasn't happened in a while. So I think it's. Well, you know, and the other thing, too, is Jay, is that. Um, the other thing that hadn't happened in a while was something that you put together and was a, very instrumental and was last year's Old Timers Day. Great. It was great. So I think that was, I mean, I, I thought that was terrific. And that was a kickoff start. I, I you know, loved it. And, you know, it's just. And it, it's I've getting a lot of calls, Roger. I mean, how do you, you do that again so soon? You know, everything clicked. Team was playing well. The weather was great. You know, 68, you know, acceptances. Peter off about a lot of about ten or eleven guys too. If I want to tell you, you know, well, so I don't want to mention your name. I thought we were friends. How come you invite me? You know, oh my God, that was yeah, it's, it's a no win. That's a no those win. Those were brutal, but you know, probably have to wait a while. You know, we, we don't want to do a Roger. We we'll bring some guys back over the weekends and stuff like that. So it just to keep the momentum going. Listen, I enjoy chatting with you. I look forward to seeing you. An amazing day. And, and I, are you going to bring stuff to make a hot foot? Say, people look forward to. I don't to know. It. I don't know. I don't know if I can find a book of matches. You think? I, can... I don't want you to get like a rest, pull off a plane or anything either. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I don't want to have any explosives on the plane. I mean, that would be good. No, no, it, 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 it really <laughs> would. It wouldn't be good. No, but you know, there are. I'm trying to think because I two of the three elements are are easy to get. I mean, cigarettes and gaffers tape. Yeah. The hard part is trying to find a book of matches. I mean, there's they're hard to find. You know what, watch if they saw it. If you wouldn't get arrested on the plane. Maybe Ray, does Rayos does Rayos have a book of matches? They probably do. You know, it would be great at all times. You know, a Met gets arrested on the plane going to Amazing Day. Then you go now, back. Then you go back to that cartoon. Hey, you want to see a Met? <laughs> Come on, Roger. I love you, Roger. Yeah, anyway. yeah. Same I appreciate brother. your time, and I look forward to seeing you next on Saturday. Okay. All right. Now, be well, my friend. Thanks, buddy.